everyone. Welcome back to our next session at the HealthSpan show today. This is a really brilliant discussion, very, very on trend and with a lot of um, great expertise and very diverse experience in this space to follow. So we're going to be looking at the concept of how to build a consumer microbiome business. We've got some really fabulous and experienced panels, uh, panelists, so I'm very excited to hand over to them. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna hand straight over to our moderator to get us started. Over to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Angela. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to this executive panel uh, to discuss how to build a, con a consumer microbiome business. My name is, is Christian Ogi. I'm the strategic um, director of strategic alliances at, at Cosmos ID. So a quick introduction about my organization. Cosmos ID is a company based in Rockville, Maryland. And basically, since 12 years, we've been unlocking the microbiome. We've built some really beautiful and strong assets to enable um, analysis of the microbiome. We democratize the microbiome analysis by providing you the opportunity to do it yourself. So I invite you to visit our website so you can see a bit more um, what we do, www.cosmosid.com. Now, around 12 months ago, we decided to go into the um, consumer market. So it's not a new business, but we decided to, to, to create a new product for a, a market segment that, that we didn't know basically, and that was for the consumer market. So not a new business, but very much like it, learning on a daily basis and, and especially learning on what, um, what to do with the consumer. So it's been, it's been challenging and, and it's been absolutely um, really um, uh, exciting uh, adventure. So now the microbiome, the microbiome has been mentioned multiple times during this week um, by different, um, by different uh, people from different organizations. And, and it's great to see this field really permeating different sectors and industries. So the microbiome is obviously super interesting. It's, it's slowly, we are slowly deciphering um, the activity of the microbe we host inside and on our body. But we are far from understanding the full picture. The field is complex vast evolving and, and but has massive potential for human health. Now, what's really exciting is that the microbiome is dynamic and it will change and adapt on, to the environment. So air pollution or food will trigger change in the microbiome that we host. Now, one aspect of the microbiome has been around developing drug, new drugs and new diagnostic, but the consumer market is really there to be taken. And, and I'm really um, delighted to be able to, to be joined by four um, uh, CEOs um, that are going to discuss this microbiome, how to create a microbiome business um, for the consumer. And, and today um, I'm joined with um, Veronica Udova, the founder and CEO of S Biomedic, Anna Janebdar, the co-founder and CEO of Juno Bio, Christopher Cook, co-founder and CEO of Carbiotics, and Gregory Lambert, the CEO of Targetis. So I will let each of um, the panelists introduce themselves and we'll start the discussion after that on you know, giving some information about the journey so far and, and the barriers and, and how to tack tackle them. But let's do the introduction first. Um, we'll start with, with Veronica, and Anna, Christopher, and Gregory, and then we can start discussing uh, the journey, the barrier, the challenge, and, and how to tackle them. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you very much, Christian, for the introduction. Um, so as, as said, I'm a CEO and co-founder of S Biomedic. Uh, at S Biomedic, we are dedicated fully to the skin microbiome. So everything around skin microbiome. Um, we have started around 2014 when we have uh, when we have got uh, inspired by the um, extremely successful gut microbiome transplantation. 
From there, we thought, okay, if that concept works so nicely in the gut, um, the same has to work on the skin. And so what we have done, we have de developed a microbiome uh, modulation technology that is really targeting the skin. And we use that technology using live, live commensals, so live skin bacteria to um, develop uh, skincare products and dermatology products primarily for acne. So our first products will go in the market uh, in acne uh, for acne prone skin this year. Uh, but we have in our program, um, in our pipeline, about six other programs, uh, which are looking at sensitive skin, at aging, at uh, tone of the skin, and many other applications. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, so me next. Uh, my name is Hannah and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Juno Bio. And at Juno Bio, we really work to decode the vaginal microbiome and what it means for women's health, wellness and fertility. Um, we currently provide women with wellness kits, which is a very comprehensive vaginal microbiome screen um, that gives them a unique insight into what their vaginal microbiome is and what it means for them, all while powering up research to close the gender health gap and really improve the standards uh, available to women. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Christian, uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Christopher Cook, uh, CEO of Carbiotics. Uh, we're, we are a uh, biotechnology company based in Sweden, uh, the south of Sweden. And the mission of the company is essentially to increase the consumption of prebiotics or, or uh, soluble fiber in people's diets. And uh, the way we're achieving this is through uh, modulators that cover everything from uh, food ingredients to uh, medical foods and therapeutics, as well as cost-effective uh, uh, diagnostics. Uh, so we were fortunate to be uh, one of the companies that could uh, sort of uh, reflect upon the early pioneers in the diagnostic space and sort of re-engineer the system to focus more on uh, low-cost uh, longitudinal testing uh, of the gut microbiome and use that to develop uh, what we perceive as more functional data. So I'm uh, definitely happy to, to per participate in uh, today's discussion. So I, I pass it on. Yes, I am Gregory Lambert. I am the CEO of Targetis. Target this uh, means targeting eating dysfunction. Uh, we started the company with two academic founders that have been working for 15 years in the um, in studying eating disorders, and um, um, from uh, discovery to discovery, they finally uh, um, um, made. Uh, available or discovered the, uh, the mechanism uh, of action or one of the mechanisms of action of uh, the regulation of the appetite through the microbiome. Um, when I, I started with the company, we really uh, had to make a decision. We could have been a, a drug company or a, um, a, a supplement company working on uh, nutraceuticals. And um, the, the regulators are not ready uh, really for, for the drug. I, I would say so far that no drugs yet approved recently based on um, um, bacterial strains. And we decided to, to go for the um, nitrocytical route. That's what we did. Uh, and, uh, but uh, to have a, a, a differentiation that is instead of saying we have more bacteria in our capsules or more strains like 10 strains with a uh, each uh, strain is uh, 10 uh, or 100 billion uh, CFUs. Uh, we have uh, one strain and actually quite a low amount of CFUs uh, and it's it's because we've, we've done those ranging, we've done mechanistic studies, we have a mechanism of action and uh, we know also that the dead bacteria is, is, are as active as the live ones because they are also working through the postbiotic that they produce. So it's it's totally different from what you can see in, in many countries, especially in the US. The more is better, it's not true. Uh, uh, what is true is uh, the science and the mechanism of action is the differentiation. And that's what we're trying to do. And uh, we have three projects. One is a, um, a product on the market that you can see behind me here. 
uh, it's a, a product that uh, regulates appetite by producing a, a protein that mimics the uh, society hormone. Uh, that one um, won yesterday the Nutri Ingredient Awards. Uh, we have a second project that is a renutrition product uh, based on a strain that increases the uh, absorption of amino acids. This one also won yesterday a Nutri Ingredient Award uh, as a research product. Uh, as a yeah research product and the other one is the product on the market research uh, uh, and the third project is uh, more early uh, we just discovered a mimetics of the oxytocin uh, in uh, strains that will uh, uh, enable to um, uh, to be active on the uh, anxiety stress and depression thanks great thank you Gregory and and and, and the panel so I'm going to jump on, on, on one aspect, what Gregory said is, is the difficulty and the barriers um, that, that you encounter. And, and Gregory, you mentioned regulatory was not ready. So did you, did you have barriers in, in, um, when you set up your business? Do you still have barriers and, and how do you tackle them? So you know, the product goes towards market. Who wants to? Uh, so maybe if I if I can start, I will basically follow up a little bit on what Gregory already said. For us, was also since the beginning basically the big question: Are we going for a drug? Are we going for a consumer product? So for us, drug means uh, dermatology, uh, dermatology drug. Consumer product for us is uh, cosmetic, is skincare. Um, I have to say that I think we are still kind of, um, yeah, a, a little bit at the borderline. So we can kind of still uh, go in both directions. Um, and in terms of the cosmetic regulation, uh, there is definitely um, discussion um, ongoing that started just a few years ago. And I think we see more and more people asking the questions, um, how to make sure that if we put bacteria or any other microbiome modulating products in, in cosmetics, that it's safe for the consumer and that we do not make claims that are not supposed to be made. Um, but other than that, I think for us so far has been relatively simple in Europe uh, going through the existing uh, cosmetic regulation. So I think at the moment we do not see need for, for new regulation, uh, but definitely having a good discussion about what technologies can we use to, to again, ensure safety and ensure that um, claims are substantiated if we go with a, with a certain claim in the market. Um. I can go next. Um, our big challenge was quite different uh, from what you've both discussed so far. Um, and it's it's not related to the technology or the science, it's actually the context in which we live in. So our big challenge was um, having people be comfortable with talking about the vaginal microbiome. And it's an issue of uh, just where we are as a society. Um, and it comes from both investors. So when we first started our company and we were raising investment, um, some investors asked us not to use the word vagina, which is a medical term and it's what our company does. Um, so that was a huge barrier for us. Um, and it's also, you know, the reason why we started Juno. We saw all this research and commercialization of the gut microbiome and soil and even skin, but literally and not very much when it came to women's health and, and the vaginal microbiome, which we thought was ludicrous. And the other sort of area where this uh, pushback comes from is... Uh, well, there, there are two. The other, one of them is actually when you're marketing this stuff, um, we ran one of uh, the biggest vaginal microbiome studies back in 2019, and we marketed it, marketed it uh, through Facebook and Twitter, but our in original ads were blocked uh, because they didn't think it was appropriate, uh, which again is completely ludicrous. And then the last group of uh, people that, you know, we really want to get this conversation going with is women, um, because women once the conversation is opened, want to talk about the vaginal microbiome till, you know, the sun goes down. But initially there is that sort of taboo and um, uh, challenge of, of opening that conversation. So that was actually our big challenge when we started Juno. You know. Yes, maybe um, uh, the challenge is um, the, uh, the, uh, the ability to uh, bring the message to the consumer uh, also in, 
in, in my field of probiotics, uh, so far, um, if you are a drug, you have an indication, so you're indicated for this or for that. Uh, if you are a, a probiotic, you cannot claim unless you get an approved claim with EFSA in Europe, uh, which is uh, for probiotics so far very challenging because there are no probiotics that got a claim approved, despite the fact that there are many uh, probiotics uh, who have mechanism of action, who have a clinical data, and uh, despite this, you cannot make a claim. So you can make the claim to, uh, to the doctors, to the pharmacists, to the healthcare professional. You can explain to them. They can, in some cases, prescribe it, but you'll never really be able to advertise uh, there. And uh, in a field uh, that is maybe also uh, a little bit special, like the weight management, where we, we have our first product, you have a lot of crazy people, not ethical at all, that make totally crazy claims, such as like you're going to lose uh, 15 kilos in two weeks, which is not a, which you cannot achieve with the drugs <laughs> that are approved for 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 obesity. So so it is very difficult for the consumer and for us to bring this message that uh, to the consumers. Uh, I, I think in our case, what we did in addressing the regulatory issues that we, we created a product roadmap, which allowed us to uh, obviously uh, tackle um, or focus on, on products which would allow us to come to market much earlier. So food ingredients was an example of that as compared to, for example, medical foods and therapeutic products. And as Gregory said, the selection or the choice to move into uh, a nutraceutical application uh, in the short term is, is probably a wise choice. Uh, as uh, there aren't uh, any, I think, uh, microbiome drugs at market today. Um, but that was not, you know, in, in, in retrospect and, uh, and looking back at what we've done, that wasn't had, had, had been the, the largest barrier, I would have to say. And I think that uh, in terms of the leg we're standing on right now, which is essentially diagnostic testing, especially in the area that uh, Christian is working in, uh, we recognize that, um, uh, there were certain limitations with the, with the current paradigm of diagnostic testing. And we had to essentially re-engineer that in a, in a way. Uh, and I think the variability of the gut microbiome was an in, impetus to that. I, that the, the gut microbiome is in a constant state of flux and therefore you need to collect more data during the sample periods and longer data sets over time to really provide uh, actionable or, or, or uh, uh, advice to an individual uh, that could assist them. We were also, at, I would have to say, extremely uncomfortable with the current paradigm of uh, microbiome testing. And I say current because it's still exploratory. Uh, we haven't moved into the longitudinal testing and taking action upon that. And we didn't feel comfortable with uh, developing uh, uh, causal relationships, uh, disease risk assessments, uh, specific dietary recommendations, let alone based on one sample, but even up to three samples in a sample set and longitudinal data. So what we did is we, we, we moved back in the space and we said to ourselves that we created an, an extremely cost-effective uh, ecosystem to essentially uh, send a, a bespoke kit to an individual, a consumer in this case, get a sample back, courier service both ways, do the analysis and provide the results. And we wanted to leverage that. And the, the only thing that made sense to us was to become a B2B play. We would offer the service to other companies that wanted to look into bioinformatics and we would provide only the backend service. Um, that also allowed us to simplify from a regulatory perspective, which again was the initial question, uh, the whole area of, of GDPR requirements when it came to collecting the samples, housing the information, and, and what to do with that afterwards. So that led to ultimately a decision to become an API provider exclusively. So now we're a B2B API provider, just providing the backend infrastructure and not having any contact with the consumer. And that is the space we carved out as a reaction to the regulatory regime, uncertainties when it comes to GDPR and how that's advancing forward. And leveraging the competitive advantages we built up over three years. Um, and in that space, we innovated in terms of 
bringing down the cost as much as possible to attain what I mentioned at the beginning, which was longitudinal testing that would provide more data for our partners to do more advanced bioinformatics and hopefully provide better services to their, uh, to their customers. Thanks. All right, thank you. So I like this idea of, of B2B API business model. I think that's really neat and, and, and very complementary um, in the consumer space. So Veronica, Anna and Gregory, you are all using a B2C business model. Any plan to look into a different model for, for your business um, in a way to create differentiation over time? Because obviously skincare, uh, multiple players there. Um, same for vaginal microbiome. There, there are players coming on the market now and, and on the direct competition on the probiotic and, and metabolic and health same thing. So are you guys looking at, at different aspects of, of, of business model for, for the future or going to stick only to what you're currently doing? So if I can jump in again. Uh, so actually for us, the consumer, I, it's, a, it's a second path only. We have started a B2B uh, originally. Uh, we have basically our main business model was around developing active ingredients for, uh, you know, for other players to put into their products. And we have, we have actually two, two deals in, in place that we, that we have ongoing with partners where we help them to, to kind of uh, develop the or implement the active ingredients into their products. Um, but we have learned there on the way, there is still so many questions about, uh, especially using live bacteria, putting live bacteria into cosmetic products. Do they have to be refrigerated? Can they be packed into formulation, into a packaging? What is a suitable packaging? How long do they survive? And so on and so on. So we have ultimately said, you know what? I mean, for us, um, it's maybe just easier to answer all these questions, developing our own product and putting the product in the market and also addressing the questions that Hannah, that you mentioned, um, how the customer actually sees, you know, putting bacteria on the skin or in vagina or any other place, you know, it's, uh, I think it's now improving also with the whole um, education of, of people through COVID and understanding, you know, the differences. So for us, actually, B2C is a little bit of a showcase approach to kind of show uh, for our B2B business how such a product can be, what type of concepts we can, we can have, and also um, kind of a... In, inspiration for, for our developments. So on the first products we have developed, which is acne and uh, skin damage uh, prevention, were purely um, R&D um, initiated. So there we understood the mode of action. We understood how the bacteria behave with the skin. So there, um, the whole reason for developing these two was really uh, research driven. And we see more and more need to kind of move into a market driven innovation. So that's why, that's why B2C. So yeah, that's that's actually for us kind of a um, complementary where we see the complementary uh, two business uh, B two B and and B two C. Anna. Yeah, yeah, I can go next. Um, we love being D two C, and I think one of the biggest reasons why is because we learn so much from our women and our users, and I really don't like the idea of being blocked from that. Uh, it's a direct access to the people that we're trying to make an impact for. Um, the second thing for us is that it, it was kind of determined by the fact that women's health and wellness is in such a dire state, right? And if we really want to make a change in the space, it has to be women powered. It has to be powered by the people that want the impact uh, made. Uh, and so those were really two big drivers for us and, and the reason why we picked a, a D2C model. In terms of like a differentiator for us, because obviously um, there will always be copycat companies in the world. Um, we ran one of the biggest studies back in 2019 and we have an unrivaled insight into the vaginal microbiome and what it means for women across ethnicities and across other vari variations, etc. Uh, and the community that we're building around Juno is really important for us and it makes sense therefore uh, for us to be uh, executing this kind of business model. If I may, um... 
So we are um, B2B, B2B2C, B2C. Uh, we develop our products. Uh, we know that to be B2C, you need to be strong uh, locally. And, um, and, and also these products, as I said before, at least in Europe are recommended by uh, pharmacists and also um, a bit like OTX products prescribed by, doc by doctors. So uh, if you get a prescription, you're going to the pharmacy, so it needs to be sold to pharmacies. So for, for most countries, we go through distributors and uh, they, they, we sell the product and they, they co-brand it. They use our brand, uh, our brand names and our strain names and uh, they make this product in their brand. So that's the B2B. Uh, uh, the, in France, we wanted to, to, to understand the consumer, as you just said, Anna. And uh, that's why we, we, we also initiated, initially started uh, B2C, uh, because we learned a lot from uh, the products that we sold on our website, and uh, especially uh, uh, getting consumer feedback. Uh, this, uh, this uh, actually, this did not help for our first clinical trial, but uh, we got the results of the consumers before the results of the clinical trial, and then this is totally in line. And at least we we felt better <laughs> waiting for the final results of the clinical trial. For the next products, we'll we we'll start with consumer studies, and this will help us to design the endpoints of the clinical trials as well. So, it's kind of uh crowdsourcing uh the clinical development uh to the consumer but if to, if to do that you you need to you need to start with something that you know already works i mean and um, if you have a strong mechanism of action a strong preclinical proof of concept and there's no con concern about safety uh, uh you, you can go there and and generate results from the consumer that that was really uh uh, uh, the, the best that we got from the, from the consumer. Right, thank you. So we, we have a question from the audience and, and I'm going to read it. And, and, and I think it's, it's quite a nice um, uh, progression of what we've just discussed. And, and, and this person is asking that given, given you all focus on different health verticals, how do you see partnerships between different fields? Um, nutrition, skincare, B2B, B2C, evolving. So basically, we know the microbiome in the body between the different sites communicates. Gut brain, uh, gut liver, um, uh, gut skin. Uh, so uh, I'm sure there will be probably gut um, uh, vaginal microbiome. I'm not aware, but maybe Anna can, can tell us a bit more. But how do you see this, this field um, collaborating potentially to develop an, another level of, of product in the future. Yeah, if I can go first there, Christian, is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, good. <laughs> I, I think this, is, this, this exact issue was the impetus as to why we moved over to a B2B or exclusive B2B uh, business model. And the reason, and that's not only in the diagnostic space, but it's also in the modulator space. So our ingredients can be sold as food ingredients or on, on, in a purified form as nutraceutical ingredients, as a backbone for medical foods and therapeutic development. This is the logic that we had. And we said to ourselves, uh, with the diagnostic testing and being behind the scenes in a, in a B2B format, we are agnostic when it comes to uh, who, who we can provide this test to. So the infrastructure can be utilized for uh, uh, epidermal microbiome testing, GI-related microbiome testing, companion animal microbiome testing. The, the, the platform is, is, is universal and can be utilized for that purpose as well. By offering it, and from our side, uh, from a B2B perspective, we could also naturally make the linkages between our different partners and create opportunities between them. And that, that means if someone focused on the epidermal side, someone else focused on uh, IBD, for example, uh, uh, we could potentially link these parties up because we, we, we were the, the, the link in that uh, opportunity in the sense that we were the consistent factor of, of, uh, or the, the supplier providing that service. Um, so this is something that we, 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 we were highly conscious of in terms of an opportunity down the road. When it materializes, we don't know. 
but we're prepared for that when it does come and we know that we can play a central role in offering the diagnostic service and being indifferent in terms of offering uh, modulators that may have an impact uh, regardless of, of the environment, the, the form factor or the channel where they're utilized. And in our case, we're obviously focusing on uh, a, an efficacious second generation prebiotic backbone. Thank you. Anna, Veronica, do you have any? Uh, it's a very it's a very interesting question and to be quite honest it's not something that i've uh consciously thought about uh, but of course for us in the vaginal microbiome space there is a link between um the gut microbiome the vaginal microbiome uh, and also just in terms in of women's health uh the gut microbiome has been associated with you know estrogen levels etc which impacts a, a woman overall um also when it comes to disrupted vaginal microbiomes oftentimes um um, women have had several rounds of antibiotics, which has caused um, the issue, but that also means that she will have issues with other areas of her, of her microbiome health. Um, so I love that Christopher is ahead of the game uh, on this, um, and I think it is a really interesting thing to keep an eye on, um, but that's all I have um, on it for the moment. Yeah, I think I fully agree there. Huh? I think we have to, and, and, and most people, I think, already do that. We see the microbiome as a holistic, uh, as a holistic kind of organ. So it's it's really difficult, I think, to detach the gut microbiome from the skin microbiome from the vaginal one. Um, so for us, uh, we think about it a lot, actually. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think we are there yet, uh, but we are definitely open for, for partnering, for collaboration, something, you know, um, having a, a, a nutritional product that supports the healing of the skin and the, the improvement in, in, let's say, our first condition of acne. It's, it's a great benefit for the customer. So I think if we can serve the customer from all the different endpoints, I think it, it really increases the value and the whole importance of microbiome as, as a whole, I would say. And that also goes with the testing. So for example, when we when we uh, run our clinical studies or when we we also thinking about, um, do we want to offer our customers to kind of sample their microbiome tested? So again, that, that's another point that um, I can very well imagine um, synergies between, between the different uh, verticals. I don't think I can add a lot on this. Again, uh, it's we, we really um, already very happy when we discover something that is meaningful, that makes sense from a mechanistic point of view in one organ. Uh, we're not there where we make the link between different organs. At least uh, the link is going to be made, uh, I think, with the people uh, processing the data and the metagenomic information from the different microbiomes. And also maybe also on the methodologies that can be applied to this data, which also is uh, at the very beginning at the moment. Uh, and uh, if a methodology works in one of the microbiome, it should work or may work in, in others. So that, that will be at the, the, the first steps uh, and, and we're probably not totally there yet. Excellent, thank you. If I could just so, add another point, Christian, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, one point I, I, I didn't mention was the fact that uh, the strategy we undertook also allowed us to get perspective on the microbiome area itself. And the fact that we needed to be humble to, and recognize the limitations of the microbiome in relation to other biometric information. And the fact that by being a B2B party in the diagnostic space, uh, we were able to tier our potential partners and customers into those which we thought would probably be providing more responsible feedback and recommendations, i.e. more holistic feedback and recommendations, either looking at blood work, uh, genomic data, uh, meeting individuals, integrating uh, uh, telemeetings with uh, medical professionals. And that, it became very uh, apparent to us that that's where things are evolving as well. The microbiome is complementary to other areas as well. And I think if you look at the microbiome in, in, in isolation, I think you, you will eventually run into problems. And that also became a core tenant of our diagnostic, or sorry, not our diagnostic, but our modulator approach, we recognized that 
we're probably in a better position if we recognize the strengths of the therapeutics rather than to challenge uh, the efficacy with a microbiome related uh, intervention or treatment. And therefore we said, it's probably better to look at a co-intervention or co-treatment that's complementary from a tempo horizon in terms of the modulation of the gut and its potential impact on an existing or therapeutic in the pipeline. Uh, if we could add value to that therapeutic in some way by addressing you know, pharmacokinetic issues or side effects of taking pharmaceutical drugs, then we would be providing more value than simply targeting uh, a replacement or competitive uh, drug to that drug at market or, or under development. So uh, I think the partnership issue is at the core of this, right? It's recognizing what you're good at, what you're maybe not so good at, and where you can add value by working with others. And I think that is the core tenet of the microbiome area. It's so easy to get seduced by the technology when it comes to diagnostics. It's so easy to believe that you have a universal silver bullet solution when it comes to a therapeutic or a, or a nutraceutical. And our strategy has evolved in, into recognizing that it's better to be humble. It's better to look at opportunities to partner and collaborate with other uh, parties. And it's better to focus on what you're doing and do that very well. And hopefully the universe, i.e. the partners or the consumers can draw value from these collaboration opportunities. All right, thank you. So we spoke a lot about the business, about the difficulties, about the opportunities, the business model. I think, I think we have a bit more time and, and we can speak now about the, uh, about the consumer. I think if we go in the consumer business, you mentioned it, we need to understand, we, we need to understand the consumer and, and the microbiome is still very early stage it's complex, it's dynamic, as I said before. And, and I think this is the difficulty. And, and, and what I'd like to know is how do you bridge the gap between the technical development of what you do, which is very, very technical, with the customer's expectation? And, and how do you educate the customer? And not only the end customer, I think the, 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 the health professional potentially will be involved. In, in, for my product, the product that I, I try to um, I lead for Cosmos ID, I speak to a lot of clinicians, I speak to a lot of customers, I speak to other business, and, and some of them, are, are just, they just don't understand what's the microbiome. And these guys have been through medical school and see patients every day. How do you, how do you navigate the, this, this ecosystem, customer, professional, um, other business that, that you are, uh, are interacting with. I, I think this, this is super important for, for the microbiome field because you're creating the first steps that the drug industry, the food industry, the diagnostic industry will be basically um, uh, using in the future because this education will already be there um, in the marketplace. Who wants to start? Yeah, I can I can give it a go. It's a big question. Um, but I think, first of all, when it comes to educating the consumer about your microbiome field, um, as Christopher alluded to in, in what he was saying earlier, it's really important to start off from the viewpoint of really understanding what the limitations of what you're doing is right and to be humble as you said Christopher about what you can really achieve um, currently when it comes to microbiome testing. At Juno we really believe that this has to be done really really responsibly because there have been examples of companies in our space that haven't done it uh, so very responsibly um, and especially fundamentally our mission at Juno is to improve the standard of uh, care and what's available for women uh, not to add to the noise and so I think it's really important that the people that are doing this educating, it starts off with the scientists and the clinicians that really understand um, the limitations, etc. Um, and then you have the challenge of putting that into a language that is 
uh, digestible, uh, for want of a better word, um, for the end consumer. And that can be challenging because you're taking quite complex and nuanced uh, pieces of information and distilling it into something that your ordinary person who might not have a sign, uh, science background can, can really understand. Um, we do this by having um, a big focus internally at Juno on content production uh, and the way that it's done and the way that it's fact-checked, etc. But I have to say that in this era of, you know, COVID-19 and pandemic, the consumer has become quite educated when it comes to the limitations of diagnostics, the way that microbes impact our life, uh, etc. So th that's my like immediate two cents uh, for, for your question, uh, Christian, and I'm sure that um, the rest of the folks here can, can add more colour. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you say that uh, now the knowledge is, is definitely improving of the customer, uh, thanks to COVID, uh, unfortunately. Uh, no, for us was a, so for us the main uh, main barrier, if you want to call it like this, is to actually uh, explain to the people that they have bacteria, that there is a bacteria on their skin, uh, you know that that they are not sterile, that and uh, that bacteria are not bad. So I think quite often there is the association bacteria, bacteria causing disease, and and that's something bad. Um, I still remember in 2014 when we started, my co-founder was uh, worried that people will think we are just making a yogurt for a skin. And, and so we asked the people around, hey, you know, do you, do, would you be afraid of that? Uh, and people even didn't know that there are bacteria in yogurts like that. It was no, it was, it was really very basic. But uh, we see a huge improvement. So in the past years, people are much more cautious about uh, about health, about uh, you know what lives inside, outside. The term is becoming, at least in the skincare industry, is becoming much more common. And I believe also with food probiotic supplements, I believe must be in the same direction. So for us, yeah, the, the biggest barrier is actually the bacteria itself, and and explain the bacteria is good. <laughs> And uh, I think going the same way what you, Hannah, mentioned, uh, content, a lot of content, 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 and trying to do it in a simple way, which is not always easy. And uh, also dermatologists. So again, experts, physicians kind of have them explaining it and, and talking and talking and talking. I think that's, but we will see, we are still going, going to go to the market. So I think I'm really curious about how, how the audience will react and uh, how it all will go. In, in the space of the, uh, the the probiotics, the food probiotics or the the, the supplements, um, in Europe uh, there are some changes now uh, allowing uh, the term probiotic to be used. And uh, myself, uh, I don't think this is really a good thing because uh, probiotics was not uh, um, something to be used uh, except from some countries like Italy before because EFSA considers uh, it is um, uh, bearing a health claim already. Probiotic means that this is a good bacteria for you. Uh, and um, what we are doing uh, is, is really uh, to work on mechanism of action. There are many companies that are really precisely studying some strains, but there are big companies or smaller companies that will be just happy if they can say this is a probiotic and then um, uh, and because there are no real serious claims that are uh, possible in Europe, I think uh, um, we are going to lose from this uh, new opening uh, about the term probiotic because uh, many big companies will just put again on their yogurt, this is probiotic. And then it's going to be really difficult and, and also uh, you're not allowed to uh, explain to the consumer that your probiotic has been uh, uh, through clinical trials and that has been proven that it works con uh, against placebo and then double blind clinical trials and it's just not a beneficial strain. In, in the US it's been kind of different. I, I was very happy to see uh, uh, about one and a half months ago, Pondulum Therapeutics with a product called Glucose Control uh, that made some claims based on the clinical trial. The FDA does not really review these structure function claims, but at the end, probably somebody complains and that went through the NAD, National Advertisement Division. And there, 
there was a decision from the NAD that the claims that are made are supported by the body of data that is available, whether it's preclinical and clinical. Uh, and, and this is totally different because then it means that you can make claims as long as you can support this. This is also true in other countries. Um, I think Japan has this kind of stuff as well. But uh, so far in Europe, uh, the problem is that you can only make your claims to, to the, the, the healthcare professionals. So, and, and this is not going to change quickly. Uh, as I said, um, many people will, be, um, uh, uh, will think it's good enough to say probiotic. Uh, yeah, in our case, uh, referring back to the uh, the original question of sort of uh, awareness and understanding in the general public when it comes to the microbiome and its re relevance, I think in the diagnostic space, uh, we obviously accept that we are still in this exploratory paradigm. You know, the transposition of the 23andMe business model into the into the microbiome space by the early pioneers, we haven't really gone through that. Ten years later, we're still there. And uh, the recognition of the, the relevance of the, of the data and how it can be utilized uh, to provide uh, efficacy validation of lifestyle and dietary changes. This is something that I think will, will grow, hopefully in the next 10 years. And if we can facilitate that growth uh, by providing low cost testing, then we've done something good. But uh, as uh, Veronica said, um, this is really about getting it into the, into the hands of practitioners and allowing them to explore the data and, and, and relate it to other data that they're collecting. This is the, the key aspect, I think. And that's something that we try to focus on as well in, in some of our partners, those who would be interacting with the medical community and creating a bridge between the microbiome and uh, normal practice, normal medical uh, advice that's given. In the case of the modulators, uh, uh, we would, had always been at a disadvantage. Obviously, Gregory's working with probiotics, which is a, an order of magnitude larger than prebiotics, uh, the area that we're working in. And it's always been a, a hard road. And the, the prebiotics association is relatively new and people are trying to uh, mobilize resources around that for the purposes of educating. And we've always tried to simplify that. We, you know, uh, we, we, we said that, yeah, the statistics are that 50% of the individuals are lacking uh, um, uh, or 80% of individuals are lacking up to 50% of, of their soluble fiber. Our, our assessment of that situation is it's, it's far higher than that. I think uh, people, 90% uh, of individuals are probably lacking up to 80% of the soluble fiber to uh, attenuate the negative effects of, of elevated alcohol, meat, uh, emulsifier, and sugar consumption in society today. So that created, creates an opportunity from our perspective. Uh, but also a challenge to communicate to people, which is essentially why we said testing has to be, become a part of this. There has to be that validation mechanism that if you're going to be changing your diet, you should be able to see before you uh, uh, undertake a change, be it diet or lifestyle, during and after. That validation tool is extremely beneficial. And we've seen this in, in studies we've conducted with companies that are uh, going to be utilized, utilizing soluble fibers in nutraceutical applications that, um, yeah, 50% say, yeah, I would consider it, but if you show me some data, then I may really consider it. And I think that's the power of the data. So the argument that has typically been used is we don't need to provide validation of efficacy because if someone feels better, then that's good enough. But I think that consumers in this world want feedback feedback that they're on the right track, feedback that if they have to make a change, they can make the change based upon uh, uh, the data that's being provided to them. And I think that that diagnostic tool does provide that, that level of feedback that's actionable, uh, especially when you're talking about the microbiome that's in, as I said earlier, in this constant state of flux, impacted by diet and stress, and medicine use, exercise, et cetera. Uh, so that feedback mechanism is, is definitely essential uh, if you're talking about introducing different modulators. And in our case, we're talking about uh, introducing more prebiotics into, di into the diets of people. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I have two more questions um, from the audience. Um, the first one is, 
how has the consumer interest in microbiome changed in light of excessive hygiene practice driven by the pandemic? I think that'd be really, really hard to measure. Um, and so any answer would be conjectural at this stage. Um, ha has their interest in the microbiome changed uh, because of excess hygiene? I mean, when it comes to the vaginal microbiome, we haven't seen an impact, um, uh, I guess, because it's a little removed from the practices of washing your hands and wearing a face mask, et cetera. Um, but, you know, Veronica, maybe you have uh, something here with the skin microbiome. Yeah, that's, that's right. You have mentioned the hands, so I think that's the, that's the first one. However, as there is no hand microbiome products yet on the market, so the customers, I don't think they make the link, but it's a very obvious then application that, that could yeah, change, change the consumer um, interest. But I haven't, I ha as, as you say, I mean, difficult to measure and we haven't run any, any studies or haven't asked that question actually ourselves. The only link that I've seen actually is uh, obviously inquiries to be able to measure uh, COVID using microbiome testing, uh, whether we could utilize our, our backend infrastructure for that, given the fact that we are running PCR as an alternative, um, as a low cost longitudinal microbiome test. Um, and yeah, so those are probably the, the main things that I've seen in terms of uh, uh, in this case, obviously, excessive hygiene practices haven't driven that, but the pandemic it, itself has created an, an increased awareness, I think, as well, of the link between gut health and immune system integrity. And this is where we were bombarded by inquiries and uh, people, because we're a public company, uh, uh, yeah, we, we're much more exposed uh, there, there's, there are pros and cons to that. One of the, one of the pros is definitely that people are, are constantly sending us information and inquiries and things like that. And we're more than happy to follow up on that. And a, a lot of those inquiries during this period were, you know, what is the link between gut health uh, and, uh, and uh, immune system integrity? And, you know, is, are there opportunities out there to capitalize on that? Uh, I didn't see personally any direct opportunities. Uh, I did it in another company, start up a, a saliva-based microbiome test that I sold in six months, but that's outside the scope of, of this discussion. Uh, so I, I, maybe long search, uh, search in terms of finding a link between the two at this stage and, and bringing to market tangible products. But uh, I would say the pandemic definitely uh, uh, increased people's awareness of the relevance of, of gut health when it came to uh, immune system integrity. Thanks. Okay. I might just add, sorry, before we move on, is that an indirect link that we saw is just, um, especially for us, for women, um, a doubling down of looking after your general wellness uh, and a, a sort of desire to look for um, things that would help uh, women just like address things that maybe they hadn't had the time or the opportunity or the cash uh, to do so before. And so that's sort of an indirect um Thing that we definitely saw. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so th there have been opportunities because of COVID, obviously, but, but um, yeah, hopefully that will stick and, and after the, we go to the next normal, basically. So last question, and then we'll, we'll draw this, this panel discussion to a close. So um, that's a very interesting question. Um, and this person is asking, most consumers are looking for the easiest solution for their health concern without changing their lifestyle. And, and, and yes, that, that's absolutely right. And the microbiome solution might need a bit of work on the consumer side, like improving diet. How do you approach that in order to show that these products work? Should I, or you want to go first, Veronica? Okay. I just wanted to quickly say, I'm not sure I fully agree, at least not from the skin microbiome point of view, because I think on, on the opposite, we enable people to, to keep doing what they were doing and kind of reestablish a health microbiome again. So at least with the technology we have, that's the whole idea that we will not force the customer to change anything. We will enable them to kind of reestablish a balanced, healthy microbiome again in the way they have been living. So not i would not i would say not true for us <laughs> uh, 
Christopher, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it, this this again, you know, uh, uh, is is at the core of what we're trying to do and the approach we've taken. Um, we we recognize the need to sugarcoat things in order to changing behavior is very difficult. First of all, so you have to you have to uh, enrich products with certain active ingredients, and if you can do that with probiotics and prebiotics, symbiotics. Um, then you fundamentally don't have to change necessarily the behavior of an individual. They can consume the same products, but enriched with different uh, active ingredients. So that's one, that's one way of, of doing that. And we know in our case that given the statistic I said earlier, earlier that nutritionists are promoting that 90% of people are lacking 50% of the, the soluble fiber or dietary fiber. That, that suggests that there's a, there's a significant opportunity to have a significant impact on people. If we believe that uh, the introduction of elevated levels of prebiotics will lead to the elevation of you know, short chain fatty acids and the upregulation of, of, of certain biomarkers on the human side. Um, so we know if, that, if we're able to sugarcoat it and we know we can elevate levels and we can, know, and we can teach people's GI systems to consume more fiber more efficiently, then we know that potentially that we can get positive benefits as well at the end of the story. And if we can validate that through testing, be it uh, bacterial testing or focusing solely on the SCFAs, wonderful, that becomes the feedback mechanism. So ultimately you don't want to change people's behavior too much. You want to look at existing behavioral patterns in terms of eating and lifestyle, and you want to integrate your products into those as much as possible. Um, if, if I may add, uh, in terms of Juno and women, and maybe it's a symptom of the way women have consumed um, products to date, um, but our consumers are very conscious of the need to have a holistic approach to their health and wellness, uh, and also when it comes to uh, changing their microbiome, and, and maybe this is to do with the fact that, you know, again, like w women, when it comes to women's health, and other aspects of it, it you, tends to need a more holistic approach to lifestyle and nutrition, et cetera, adjustments. And maybe they're just more used to it therefore, but we don't, we, we see a real understanding uh, when it comes to our users um, and that you might need a, a longer term sort of approach to, to what they're trying to achieve. Also, I think what our product enables women to do is to swap out things that is already part of their uh, behavior. So maybe swap out the probiotic they're taking for another one that um, could be more helpful for them, uh, etc. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we arrive at the end of this our discussion. So um, it's been an honor really to, to speak with all of you um, uh, during this panel. Um, thank you very much. Um, for, for being part of it. Thank you to the audience for listening and for asking questions. Thank you to the organizing team. That's, um, it, it's a brilliant conference and, and I hope uh, that there will be another one and, and where we can meet um, in the real life, I would say. So a post-COVID conference will be nice. Um, I hope this discussion has, has been helpful to you and how to build a consumer-based microbiome business. Um, the future is super exciting for, for this sector and, and basically uh, likely to have a huge um, effect on health. Span. So thank you very much. Have a good evening, a good rest of the conference. And, and I hope um, I can see you in person uh, next year. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Christian. Um, for wonderful facilitation there. Thanks, of course, to our panel. I feel so privileged to just listen to that incredibly rich discussion. Um, thanks, of course, to our audience for being so engaged and getting involved in the chat. Um, now, do stay with us. We've got a really great Ask the Investors session looking specifically at women health, women's health. So if you are launching a business in this space, do join. Um, they're not just exclusive to women's health. So if you if you have some burning questions for investors in the, in the um, consumer space, make sure you do join that session next up. Um, and then stick around with us for a couple more panels this afternoon. But in the meantime, I will say thanks once again to you all for watching. Thanks to Christian and our panel and goodbye. <laughs>